honored to be here and I'm thankful for all of you for coming out to a program like this because we wouldn't be sitting up here, I wouldn't have this opportunity if not for such a captive audience. Um, and of course, thank you to uh, the Sick Art and Film Foundation for putting this program together with the support of sponsors and everyone who works so hard. Um, won't take too much time, so we'll get started. Uh, I'm sure the panel is excited to share their thoughts uh, on this auspicious year uh, that we get to talk about these things. The theme is doing well by doing good. Um, you know, promoting not just uh, consciousness, but enabling others to do that by showing them how to do that, right? Uh, believing in doing well by doing good is one thing. Making it a reality is another. Um, I would open this question up to the entire panel. Um, how do you actively go about making this happen? Navneet, let's start with you. First of all, thank you so much for having us and having um, all of us join here today. <clears throat> I apologize for my throat. Um, I think one of the most important um, takeaways for me is that it's really important that each one of us um, is engaged, especially in the current climate. I think it's really important and imperative that, that all of us, um, whether you know, from the Sikh community and beyond, actively participate in our local communities. Now, participation can take many forms. Um, not everyone needs to feel that they have to be um, leading an organization or coming from a corporate background, and it can take uh, many forms. You could be active in your local community in the school board. Um, you could be active volunteering in a community organization that you believe in. But as it was said earlier, social justice and human rights are the cornerstone of the Sikh faith. And that's what our, our gurus and Guru Nanak especially, that's one of the teachings. So it's really important that going beyond that belief and making sure that if you see something, do something about it. If you see something that's unjust, it's not right. It's good for all of us to have opinions on it, but I think the key is to get out of your comfort zone and, and to get out there and take a concrete step towards forcing that change. Uh, Ms. Kaur, when we talk about the Sikh faith, uh, you have an, a special uh, understanding and expertise in this regard. Um, what are your thoughts on, on how you can actually make doing well by doing good, make what our gurus, uh, the teachings they left for us, by making that a reality? What are some steps that we can actually uh, apply in our day-to-day -day lives? Mm. <clears throat> so, you know, when I um, looked at the you know, when the, um, the topic that came in, be, doing good or something was. Mm -hmm. So I Googled it mm -hmm. and said, who said this? Mm -hmm. And it was Benjamin Franklin. Mm -hmm. So he said this phrase and, um, and I thought about it. Then reflect back to, you know, my source of strength, mm -hmm. which is, um, you know, at the Guru Granth Sahib. And I come back to that is that it goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You just can't go out and do good because you really don't know what good is. Mm -hmm. So it's firstly within incorporating whatever that wisdom is within you, mm -hmm. whatever that sense of justice is within you. Mm -hmm. And when you are at some level at peace with it or have come to terms with, then you go out and do whatever it is that you do. Mm -hmm. Because we become these so-called activists without that fundamental knowledge of what it is that we are actually fighting for. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it hurts us. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is that understand yourself. What is your core? Mm -hmm. Be comfortable with it. And then be that mm -hmm. and everything else will follow. I think those are some wise words. It's like uh, driving a car without having a destination. Absolutely. I mean, you, you just can't. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what it means to uh, do well, the well and good. I, I don't understand that. Mm -hmm. It is if you are actually centered, everything will flow from there. Mm -hmm. And that's wellness. Yeah. And when you're centered, everything that you do is goodness. Yep. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, uh, Shipreet, I'm going to jump to you. Uh, what are some things that you think, actionable items, right, uh, that you can make this a reality? You can make doing well by doing good a reality? Um, 
So uh, I'm going to continue from what Iniji said. You really don't know what is good. Mm -hmm. And even if you did, and you did it, the question is, whatever that happens to you, is it well or not? Mm -hmm. Both of those are, are questions. I, I did the same research. I came up with Benjamin Franklin. And then I said, what is, what is my Benjamin Franklin? And that's obviously Guru Nanak. Past, uh, past uh, year or so, I've been focusing on Guru Nanak. I was t talking to you about this. Mm -hmm. Because of, of this uh, auspicious year, I've been trying to focus on his Bani. So the, you know, the way I think about what are the three steps? Mm -hmm. What are the three steps of Guru Nanak? Right? What are the three steps? Well, normally we would say, Nam Japo, Kirt Karo, Varn Chako. I don't think Guru Nanak said it, and this is probably not a great place to explain why that is. Uh, I think it's very misleading, and it, I, I don't think it has anything to do with, with Nam. Nam. Nam is a lot bigger, mm -hmm. a lot bigger concept than those three things. Mm -hmm. His three steps are very simple, and they're, he goes through them in the Japji Sap, and they are sing. The purpose of life is to sing. And when you sing, or <coughs> you, you, you have to be able to hear before you sing. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a singer, anyone who's sung knows you cannot sing until you hear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you cannot do any of those two if you don't have the love. Gaviye, sunye, man rakhiye bhav. Sing, just like the air is singing, the, the wind is singing, the earth is singing, the planets are singing. Mm -hmm. And are you listening? And if you can, you will get the answers. If you do this by love, mm -hmm. you will get the answer to what is good from the gyan that is within you. Wow. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, folks, even folks who don't have a good singing voice should dabble in this. Uh, to, you to know, <laughs> generally I say, I, 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 I'll meet someone on the elevator and I'll say, hey, you know what, the purpose of life is to sing. As, as a startup. <laughs> and, and he says, look, and they look at strange with me. And sometimes they say, you know what, I, I don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. And I ha you know what, I say, you don't need a voice to sing, you need a heart. Very true. Um, Dr. Sandhu, I'm going to jump to you next um, with our opening question. But before we do the question, I believe you have a small clip from a TED talk that you did that uh, you brought here with us. So if, if we can play the, the video. So, so yeah, so I'm, I'm going to indulge a little bit because you know all, uh, each, other, each other very well. I'm new from the West Coast. And I really wanted to answer this question in the context of who I am. Mm -hmm. what my life's journey has been. Mm -hmm. And I am a bathroom singer. I have graduated to... <laughs> I have graduated to being a, a drawing room singer now. Excellent. Uh, I, I discovered my singing talent after both my sons actually were very... turned out to be pretty good musicians and uh, uh, singers. Then I figured... And my wife's okay singing, so I figured that... Okay. <laughs> graduated, but so, my wife is okay. Uh, but, no, 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 no my, my wife says she's okay, let's put it this way. Then say it must have been my talent which passed on to me. So, Spoken like a man. So I should explore, I should explore uh, that talent. Do I need to do something? Oh, okay, sorry. So I really wanted to kind of give you some perspective of where I come from. So I'm mostly in the technology sector, and the technology we make goes into your devices. These are the memory chips you, you use, and I'm going to connect it to your, your, that was my whole TED talk. I brought it up down to answering your question, but it won't take me 18 minutes to do so. No hopefully. problem. Uh, so essentially, uh, so I worked for a company which was pretty small at the time, and as a student, you go with your heart. Mm -hmm. What your heart says is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Not just for me, but just for what I was going to, about to do. Mm -hmm. And I went, I went, joined this company in Boise, Idaho. Mm -hmm. I was probably the only person with a turban in a three-state area at the time, until uh, my father came to see me. 
and, and went there with a two-year plan. It was a huge risk. I said, okay, well, this makes sense. Let's do it. But this company has turned out to be one of the three top companies right now, but, but that's not the point. The point is the work I felt like was the right thing to do, was going to impact the society in the right way. And that's what I chose to do. Uh, in terms of computers, this is my background. When I was a student, that's the computer I saw. The computers you have in your pocket is 200 times more powerful and a million times less costly. So a million times, so, so technology, so my thesis is that technology is one example where technology can do good. It has done good mm -hmm. for the society. We reap benefits of it. Mm -hmm. This is one of those technologies with over my career, when I was in college and now, the devices you have, there has been one million times improvement in capability. At the same time, there was a million times reduction in cost. So million into million is a billion. That's a billion times of something good happening through this technology, mm -hmm. which has made our modern lifetime, uh, uh, modern life possible. You can argue whether technology is good or bad, but technology has happened. It, it has been very good for equalizing the world. Mm -hmm. You have children in India, women all over the place, where in that society they may not have any rights or be able to do anything through technology. They have been empowered. Mm -hmm. Entire countries and generations yep. have yep. been empowered. Yep. Great. So, so my career usually feels like this, uh, I don't know if you've done this activity, <laughs> <laughs> zip lining. And, and technology is like zip lining. You cannot, speed is the predetermined. You don't have, there's no brakes. Technologi technological progress has happened over 50,000 years, starting from the wheel, the f controlling of fire, all those things. So now it's just faster. So my career has been more like, we can't control the speed, but let's control the direction. Mm -hmm. So if, because if you don't control the direction, you run into trees, and you don't look that cool, actually, <laughs> after you're done with it. So it's really all of us, for all of us too, even if you can't control the speed, because certain things are global, they mm -hmm. just happen. Mm -hmm. Let's do what we can to control the direction and feel uh, and have it go in a direction where we feel like it's the it's the best way to go. Mm -hmm. So, indulge me for a couple more minutes. Uh, so, so really, what's going to happen here in technology is that we have computer systems now, which are going to have capability of human brain pretty soon. But very soon, within a few decades, there will be a computer system, one system capable of all human brains on this planet, and that's within realistic time frame. So imagine this technology is going to become so powerful mm -hmm. and we worry about what's going to happen then, artificial intelligence and so forth. And usually what I say, tell people is humans as a species is the overpowering artificial intelligence for all the other species. Mm -hmm. yeah. And our track record is terrible in how we treat this planet. So with this new technology, artificial intelligence, if, it's, if, if we program the ethics of this new artificial intelligence to be only slightly better than humans, we'll be in pretty good shape. They will not decimate the planet like we have done. So, so I'm coming back to you. It's, all, it's, it's what we do, we control. I do want to play this clip, and especially for the younger audience here, uh, and there's a maybe, so this was part of the TED talk. I, was, I had the privilege and um, honor to be invited to give a TED talk um, earlier this year. And I will play this and then maybe after some other questions answer the relevance of what happened as part of that. That comes back to doing good as well as trying to be sick and visibly uh, sick. Uh, maybe it'll play. I was born in London, shipped to India at the age of three with my parents. Did early school there, moved to North Carolina for my college then ended up in Boise, Idaho, working for Micron Technology. So I had lived and traveled across half the globe before I got my first real job. My family uh, belongs to a religion called Sikh, that's spelled S-I-K-H. To make it simpler to pronunciate, sometimes we call it Sikh, which actually matches the literal translation of the word, which is to seek knowledge, to learn. Now, one of the tenets of this faith is to not cut your hair. So, to keep my hair tidy, I tie a turban around my head. Now, the color of the turban usually doesn't mean much, except it's a fashion statement. 
just to match the color of your wardrobe. Now, if you see a bunch of people with colorful turbans, now you know. However, if you see people dressed up like this, with big flaring turbans, that usually means they're getting ready to jiggy. <laughs> yep, jiggy. So I don't know about you, but every time I see people dressed up like this, certain music starts playing in my head. Something takes over my body. And just like that young, handsome man, in that picture, I start doing this. Do you hear anything yet? That was fun. <laughs> Sorry, let's get back to the topic, which was, oh, innovation. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for indulging in that. Um, the picture I was referring to, it didn't show up, but the audience in the video was seeing it was, was, was that picture. Um, so so my, my dancing talent did come out on a world stage through a video. <laughs> and I still remember my, my aunt telling me to dance at my cousin's wedding who's sitting here, and I was so hesitant to do that. I couldn't dance for it. I didn't want to show anybody my dancing. And I've gone from there to doing this. Can I say a story about the TED Talk? The, why did I show this? So this was an invitation to talk about innovation, the role of innovation, and, 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 and how innovation can do good for the planet. Mm -hmm. And we, we can t talk about other things in there, but my point here was, I wanted to put this clip in, and my coaches, everybody was totally against it. Mm -hmm. And I had to explain to them, okay, I'm in front of the audience. That audience had one person with a turban and maybe a few Indians, but most of the audience had no clue who I am. And I'm right here, they're thinking. They're thinking that, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to convey a message which has to connect to their hearts. And this was not a technology, technology talk. This is a talk about how technology can connect with you. What is it doing for you? So they have to first connect with me. I have to talk about myself. I have to at least explain to them where I come from. So that was the 90 second video. Now the Bhangra dance actually, there was a connection of that to creativity and exactly what you said. And, and Guru Nanak Dev Ji actually realized that. And actually, if you go back 4,000 years into the Vedas, the connection of the role of music and arts in innovation and creativity, as well as connectivity with the universe, the chit, the universal dimensions we don't know. We live in three dimensions. The actual universe is much more. So this music is actually connecting us to that. We cannot comprehend it. We cannot understand it. The sound is a wavelength. So it's actually true. And the modern physics is actually uh, supporting some of that. So doing well is one of those. Feeling good and doing well is, the, is one of those same compulsions we have within us. <coughs> so my short answer to your original question is, <laughs> because everybody said, what's good? So my father actually told, taught me that. And he said, there's only two rules. Never do something to others you don't want somebody else to do to you. So never treat somebody the way you don't want to be treated. And other one is simple. Treat others the way you would like to be treated yourself. So I'm done now. <laughs> Wise man. <laughs> Father. Yes, he, he was. I think um, between the singing talent up here, we have a competition <laughs> with the dancing talent yeah. now. So Shafrit, that's a direct challenge to you. Um, when we talk about doing well by doing good, in this political climate, uh, all sorts of uh, you know complications arise. Uh, these are very interesting times that we live in. Uh, Namneet, this one's for you. What are some of the challenges that you've encountered, um, specifically, you know, being in the nonprofit sector um, for as long as you have, uh, you know, when you're trying to accomplish doing well by doing good in, in this political climate? 
So I think one of the, the bigger challenges that we're facing um, as a women's rights organization and a South Asian women's rights organization um, is that in the current climate, the anti-immigrant rhetoric that's coming out of the current administration mm -hmm. um, is a, not only a serious source of concern, but um, extremely frustrating, mm -hmm. and it's adversely impacting um, a lot of the, the survivors that we work with. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an example, also I think another issue also is um, women's reproductive rights mm -hmm. are under attack mm -hmm. uh, by the current administration. So reproductive justice is a significant issue that we work on. Um, the survivors of gender-based violence that we support and that we work with, mm -hmm. very often those survivors are, um, they happen to be women who are on age four. Um, they're on dependent visas on their spouses um, and they are threatened by deportation by the, by the perpetrator who happens to be the spouse. Um, and as a result of that, they don't report the domestic violence or gender-based violence to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a reality. It's not, it's not a, a story um, that you might hear or a theory. It's a reality that we see day in and um, day out. And it's um, no matter how much we try to support these survivors, this fear is legitimized um, by the current administration because we are seeing um, a rise and an increase mm -hmm. um, in immigrants being picked up, even those who actually have legal visas. And we even have situations where um, I've worked with uh, people who are on H-1 visas. And that's like, you know, they, they're, they're employed, they go to, we've had people who went to India and they're held up in India because, or other countries, um, because they're doing these long, laborious, bureaucratic um, investigations or questioning and they're unable to come back. Mm -hmm. um, as a women's rights organization, the women's rights are something that are absolutely under attack. Um, the office of um, the federal agency, which is the Office of Violence Against Women, was one of the first things that was under attack. And um, we were told that there was even consideration or potential, or there was an opinion um, that that agency was an un necessary use of funds and was not needed. Funding is a huge barrier for us. Mm -hmm. um, so if the, the current climate or the political opinion is that women's rights are not a priority, then of course organization like ours will be impacted. So I think as, um, you know, as women of color, um, we, and, and as, as a South Asian community, as a Sikh community, mm -hmm. it's really important for all of us to be mindful, to not only be aware of these barriers and challenges, but to be actively engaged um, in, in trying to do something about it and to, to participate. Mm -hmm. When it comes to, you know, I think I would urge everybody here to take the time when it comes to things like um, there's a legislation on violence against women. Um, and that's something that we as a women's rights organization joined forces with women's organizations throughout the country, but not just women's organizations. Any advocacy group, and, and that's the point that I think we'll bring out later on, how important collaboration is. Mm -hmm. um, we do need to be, you don't need to be an attorney. Um, you know, I used to practice an attorney, but you don't need to be an attorney. You don't need to be a policymaker. Sometimes ordinary people um, need to step into the shoes um, of policymakers or elected officials if they are not doing their job properly. So my request to everyone here is um, we can all be activists. Um, that's a very, you know, it, it's a term that's defined by what your values are, what's important to you. Be true to yourself mm -hmm. um, and act on what you think um, good may mean to you. But it's important to step out of that comfort zone and absolutely be actively engaged because we can no longer afford to be apathetic in the current climate. If everyone in this audience were to take some of the lessons from today's panels and go out and try to bring about the change that we all know we need and are working on actively, what is some things that you would tell them to do? Basically, I want, and this is for all of you, tell us, what does it take to cultivate a community of leaders? If you wanted to make everyone in here a leader to, to, to take these teachings, to do well by do good, what is it that they need to be doing? We'll start with you. So I think one, sometimes um, the way we frame things, so sometimes I think the, the term leader 
um, may be off-putting to, to people. You know, it sets the bar um, very high. Um, I think I, I, would, I would probably frame it in a much simpler way. So as a mother of two young children, I have a seven-year-old son and a 12-year-old daughter. Um, I think instilling those values early on uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, my husband and I do try our, our you know, best or, or as we can to engage our children in those conversations about social justice and human rights. And those may sound like big terms to little kids, but I think it means something as simple as if I'm engaging my son in a conversation about um, standing up to a bully when you're not the one being bullied, mm -hmm. right? Making sure that when you're in the park or when you're out there and you see something where you think you may not be the person being impacted, but do you have a responsibility to stand up and speak out and be fearless while doing that? So I think, you know, and, and some women's rights is something I obviously feel very passionately about. So engaging my seven-year-old son in the same way that I engage my 12-year-old daughter is absolutely fundamental. And I think it's so important in our own, we need to look within our community and beyond. In our own community, there is a gender bias. In our own community right here, um, there is deep-rooted patriarchy. We do need to recognize that. We do need to acknowledge it. We do need to talk about it. Um, it's, you know, we have gender roles which are defined. We have gender norms where um, women, or there's an expectation that women fit in a certain um, a norm. So I think it's important to challenge those. It's important to challenge um, patriarchy, and it's really important for men in our community to be equally engaged in the women's rights movement. Women's rights movements doesn't just impact women. So it's important that we look at it as a community. So to answer your question, I think we do need to engage the next generation. It could be a seven or a 12 year old or, or you know, teenagers or younger sitting here to make sure that they connect mm -hmm. with those issues mm -hmm. Um, and engagement can mean something different for everybody. You do not need to lead a movement when you leave this room here, but thinking about what, how you can um, take a step by attending a meeting, by supporting an advocacy group, mm -hmm. by writing an op-ed, by um, you know, going to a, a, a protest, whatever it may be for you. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to get out of that comfort zone um, and not always play it safe um, and not um, worry about how your role in society is defined and fitting in that comfortably. Get out, get out of your comfort zone and be true to yourself. Uh, Eniji, same question. You have to cultivate a community of leaders. We're gonna start right here in this room. What do you, from your particular experience, think needs to be a first step in this regard? You know, leaders is a tough word. It's a really tough word and it's not a word that I'm comfortable using. I would like to reframe mm -hmm. that question. Mm -hmm. um, how do you cultivate yourself? That's the question really, mm -hmm. because it all begins from within. Mm -hmm. I'm a strong believer of that. And, you know, Shafreet uh, said some, uh, you know, he invoked the, the morning prayer, the Japji Sahib of Guru Nanak Sahib. And I want to go and invoke something else. It is actually when you recognize your own divinity, when you recognize that you are a spark of divine light and that the, the same spark of divine light is in every human being, but then the Guru takes it further, that we are all a part of that one. So when you recognize and feel it and believe it, you act from that place. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you stand up for social justice, you stand up for any wrong, you stand up for anything, and you know what is good. Mm -hmm. But the first important step for each and every one of us, if there was one thing I could say, and the only thing, know yourself, know your source of strength, recognize your divinity, that you are a spark of divine light that the divine is within you and in each and every other person as well. Mm. We had, there is no separation between the divine and you. So act from that place. That's it. 
Dr. Sandhu? So leadership in some ways means standing out, mm -hmm. not being part of a group. Mm -hmm. That is not a natural human condition. We don't feel naturally comfortable there. Mm -hmm. So to be a leader, first of all, you have to, be, you have, to have the inner strength. Mm -hmm. You have to have a strong foundation inside of us. Mm -hmm. When we talk about our kids, the most important thing, every, every person in the world needs to know where they come from. That's, our, that's the longing we have. Because our inner base is based on who we are. So when we have kids here who may look different, who our parents look different, first, our first responsibility is to make sure when they're very young that they know where they come from and, hope, and then you hope that they are proud of that. You, can make them, you cannot make them proud of that. But tell them where they come from and hopefully they will be, become proud of that. And that's what I did in my family. Because it's all, it's all inside of you. Now, everybody has a different method and a way to discover that strength. I'm an introvert. When my mother finds out I'm talking like this, even to this day, she finds it hard to believe that her son, who she never heard speak in the house, other than when he was hungry, he'll ask for food. Uh, then I had to show him her the video. This is what I'm doing. Wow. So she, she can't believe where I've come from and where I am today. And I have friends and family here, and they know the same. I ended up in Kansas as a 22-year-old student with a turban on. And I was in India before that. It was such an uncomfortable feeling. I didn't know where I'm, I, I mean, it was so odd. I felt so odd. I was an introvert. I just wanted to go inside. Mm -hmm. Just, I hope nobody's looking at me. Mm -hmm. That forced me to make a decision. What, what do, okay, how am I going to deal with this? Mm -hmm. Somehow that strength came from within me. Mm -hmm. Then I connected it back to how my father had indirectly given me stories, and he talked me about Sikh kids. We were, we were, we were not a, he was not, not a dev, devout Sikh. We were never that. But he had told us the stories of what Sikhism is all about. Mm -hmm. Equality, equal rights, women, all that. Mm -hmm. Somehow that strength came out of nowhere. I had no idea I had that inside of me. Mm -hmm. So the reason I tell you that story is that anybody and everybody can be a leader when they're confronted with a certain situation. If you have a strength of conviction, you have to go find that strength inside of you to stand out and lead. Mm -hmm. And most of the kids we have who are different, and in general it's true for all the, all the immigrants which, which come from different societies, but especially in our society, we look different. Uh, you know, if, if you're wearing a sari or a salwar or you have a long hair, we all look different. Turban looks different. So, so we are tested time and again. So we have an opportunity, actually, to find that strength early on. In our, mm -hmm. our kids have that opportunity early on to find that strength within them. Mm -hmm. Once you find that strength, you're all the leaders. You, you'll be able to lead in those other situations naturally because mm -hmm. you've been trained already. You had to get trained regardless of your choice. Mm -hmm. Shipri? I, th I think the best way to lead is I... I, I agree with Iniji that it's to understand oneness completely. Um, understand that you're one uh, with whatever's around you and within you is the oneness that surrounds you. And once we understand that, and, and the question really was, you know, let's say we're, we're done with this talk now and, and everyone goes out, what do you do? What, do you, what, is, what can you materially do that, that might be good? The best thing you can do, Guru Nanak says, Kal mein Ram Nam Sar. Understand the oneness. Because once we understand the oneness, we can fight against injustices. Mm -hmm. And once we understand oneness, we understand that the best way to lead is to serve. And the wonderful thing about service is every one of us is endowed with different passions. We sing different songs in our life. The songs that I sing are perhaps Guru Nanak's songs and, 
and you know, I, I work for a company that fights cancer. Those are my two songs, right? And if, a, if and this happened last year, a, a, a musician comes to me who's been playing with me and says, look, I've, I've been found, I have cancer, and I'm going to die, and uh, I don't think there's anything to do, and you know, thank you, and s uh, say the prayers for me. It, you know, it, it behooves you to find out what it is, and if you can, you can help them get to the right doctors, because they probably didn't have the right connections, or they thought they didn't have the money, because they're a musician. And they, they wouldn't even think about treatment. And uh, the good news is this person who called me last year thought she was going, I'm, I'm recording with her next month. Because I, I said, look, well, and you can, this is fixable. And here are the docs that we need to call. And it, I wasn't necessarily doing something that I thought was good. Mm -hmm. it, this, this just came to me, and in the moment, understanding that this, this was my way to serve, I did it. And now, this oneness is serving me back because I get to have fun and record. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about oneness and some of the core tenets of Sikhi, equality and, um, you know, coming together as opposed to, you know, focusing on the things that set us apart, in the South Asian community, generally there is in a, a, a tendency to look inwards. We ourselves are very, uh, you know, we like to put up fences around, okay, we are Indian, or we are Sikh, or we are Punjabi, or we are South Indian. Um, even within the community, this lack of diversity affects our ability to develop a diverse social network. Um, I mean, forget about connecting with non-Indians, not non-Asians, right? Um, but this is probably the most important thing we need to be doing, especially folks that live in Western countries. They need to be making these inroads with everybody and, and showing them who we are. Um, what do you recommend, uh, Iniji, I'll, I'll go to you first, how we can change that to push outside of the, that, you know, a, a normal reaction to just look inwards? So my reaction is, normal, As a community, my normal yeah. reaction is to look outwards, so, you oh. know. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> oh, well, you know, the reason being is because I didn't grow up in a Indian or a Sikh community. I grew up in a very um, diverse community. Mm -hmm. So for me, it is, you know, very natural. natural. Mm -hmm. I, I think for me, it was when I, um, when I was appointed CEO of Sikh Research Institute, that is where I dealt more with the community mm -hmm. and was appalled, appalled mm -hmm. to see this... Um, this pettiness and these camps within the mm -hmm. uh, so-called camps within the community because I had been sheltered mm -hmm. before that. You know, 9-11, when 9-11 took place in the United States, it was a turning point in my life because previously, up till then, I was concentrating very much on the school systems in, uh, you know, in Connecticut, doing presentations and being very involved with the children. Mm -hmm. Mind you, I also had young children. Uh, when 9-11 came, um, I realized I had a duty. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate, and I'm very blessed, that I can speak in public, um, that I have a voice. So I started, you know, doing those rounds, police stations, and speaking to the press, and all that. But not everyone can. You know, you recognize that. And also, not everyone in the community can go out and be comfortable with the broader community. Mm -hmm. We must recognize that. Mm. Because for whatever reason, we as a community, and forgive me for bunching everything up together, are very apologetic. Mm -hmm. We're very apologetic of who we are. Um, you don't necessarily need to be proud, um, but you don't need to apologize. Why do you think that is? I have no idea. It's, it, 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 it boggles the mind. Mm -hmm. Like, 
Well, well, you know, we have this long hair, but we are, we do carry the, you know, it's not actually a, a dagger. It is, I mean, we go to umpteen lengths to explain our articles of faith, where it's quite simple. It's because we're not comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. So I recognize that. And it is for them to get comfortable within themselves mm -hmm. before they can get comfortable outside. But within the community, um, you know, this diversity and being inclusive, I mean, I can tell you quite categorically, I have never faced so much discrimination as I have within the community. Literally, left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what hit me. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, uh, I think, the kindness. <coughs> we begin with kindness. Mm -hmm. And we begin with recognizing that no matter what anybody is doing, it's actually serving. You know, for me, I look at it that we are all, um, we are foot soldiers in Guru's army. And each one of us has an incredible talent, whether we are chopping onions, or we are looking after the horses, or we are fighting on that horseback, or we are writing a poem or we are singing. Each one of us has been blessed with a talent and a gift. Mm -hmm. And when we recognize that, maybe we will be kinder, and maybe then we will be kinder to each other. We've got to be kinder to each other first before we can be kinder to anybody else. Mm -hmm. Because that's a step out. We actually need to be kinder to the people within our community mm -hmm. and not label them you know, well, he's not a practicing Sikh because he doesn't do this, or she's not that because mm -hmm. she doesn't have that. I mean, if we can just bring that together, mm -hmm. maybe then we can say, we are one, and now we are ready to celebrate our oneness with the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was a bit of a mouthful, I apologize. <laughs> but I was on this bandwagon, <laughs> and I apologize. But it really is, you know, how do you be, how can, you can't be, you can't go out and tell everyone, well, I'm a Sikh and I'm brown and I have this hair and I have this. And that's not who we are. Mm -hmm. People accept you for who you are, what you carry, what you project, how comfortable they are with you. But here first, you have to be comfortable with yourself. Absolutely, and ultimately, your actions, right? A absolutely. Um, they speak, speak for themselves, yeah. yep. Yeah. Uh, Navneet, when we talk about human rights in general, human yeah. rights don't discriminate against anyone. Mm -hmm. They are needed for everyone, and mm -hmm. people who are uh, victims of human rights abuses, whether it's domestically or, or on any level, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're not exclusive to one community or faith, um, or gender even. Absolutely. In your work, how do you overcome this divide that the South Asian community tends to put itself into, to divide itself up, I mean, mm -hmm. to our own detriment? How do you mm -hmm. overcome that? So I think it's absolutely true that, that we as a community do do that, and I think it's really, really important to strike the right balance mm -hmm. uh, between looking inward but also being mindful and, and appreciating the commonalities that we have with other diverse communities. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, as a Sikh community, as a South Asian community, um, we have shared experiences with the Latino community when it comes to immigrant rights. Mm -hmm. um, we have shared experiences with the African American and LGBTQI community when it comes to bias crimes. Mm -hmm. we, it's very important for us to not put ourselves, um, I don't wanna say pedestal, but I think there's a concept of othering, um, which is this happens to others, right. but not us. This effect affects X, Y, Z community, but not us. So the whole concept of othering is, is something that we need to challenge. Um, it's really important for us to not only collaborate with other communities, but I think have a collective voice um, you are a better advocate when you're not advocating in isolation. Um, and I think it's important for us to 
make sure that when we look at other diverse communities, we are looking at our shared experiences, we are focusing, focusing on what we have in common as opposed to um, the differences that we may have. Um, and, and, you know, which is why I mentioned there are different ethnic communities, but there's also the LGBTQI community, there's um, different genders, there's different, I think we need, need to look at um, diversity in its entirety, not just based on color, ethnicity, or even gender, and ensure that as a community, we are aware and we are there and present and actively engaged and advocating for, for all those communities when they're impacted and not just thinking about ourselves. And I think an example um, from 9-11, after 9-11, this was something that was very prevalent um, where, you know, um, some, some in our community, one of the first gut instincts was that, oh, I'm not a Muslim, or we're not a Muslim, uh, we, we're, we're a Sikh community, this, this, is not, you know, this is not our issue. Um, so I think it kind of just brings it home that um, we, and this is again going back to Guru Nanak's teachings, and going to the, back to the teachings of our gurus, uh, when we talk about Sarbat Pala, you know, like we, we, um, we were talking about that with our kids one day, like what does that actually mean? Um, it doesn't mean looking out for the Sikh community only. Okay. It doesn't mean that at all, in fact. So we had to break it down for our kids. And I think sometimes, and we may all be guilty of this, sometimes, you know, I've heard the term Sarbat Pala all my life, and we all have, but I think breaking it down in the context of human rights and social justice is so crucial. Um, whether it be in your everyday work or, or just your personal life. So our kids also understand and the, the next generation understands that Sarbat Dabala or, or Seva uh, means everybody. It means beyond the Sikh community. It means looking out and standing up for those who may not be part of the Sikh community in the, with the same conviction as we would for our own. And that's harder. Um, it's easier said than done, but I think those really are our Guru's teachings um, that we need to not just think about ourselves. And I think collaboration um, and, you know, looking at shared experiences is absolutely key. When we talk about collaboration and going beyond the confines of what we're comfortable with, uh, connectivity, um, in today's technological climate, uh, Dr. Sandhu, you gave us a wonderful breakdown of how far we've come and you know how exponentially fast we're going to grow just in our lifetimes uh, from a technological standpoint. In today's world, we're highly interconnected. Um, there's no difference between the chaiwala in India who has his iPhone and someone in the United States in New York City with an iPhone. The device is the same and so is the internet connection. Um, what role does actually networking beyond the uh, you know borders of our our specific community um, to have that uh, higher level of diversity in our day-to-day -day lives what role does that play in making choices to see how we can improve innovation and like you said <clears throat> not control how fast it's going but definitely control the direction so there's a historical data set which I actually I show in one of my talks so there's three pieces to it. One is the connectivity ask, then the other two are diversity and inclusion. They're all three are ex in, increase, in, extremely important, and there's a measured impact of growth of innovation from all three of those. Mm -hmm. So connectivity, actually, if you think about uh, when the printing press was invented, and you can look at you know a chart in printing press, phone, internet. And if you measure new technologies through some metrics, you know, now you can measure through patents, but in the past you can measure through other innovations. There's an inflection point every time a technology was developed which made the barriers to communicate and collaborate lower, mm -hmm. every time. So every time connectivity was enhanced, mm -hmm. innovation pace had a measurable impact if you go all the way back to the uh, ancient men, species, uh, not men, species, sorry. <laughs> ancient, humans. Apology accepted. You're going to get us kicked out of here. Yeah, um, I'm looking for protection here. If, 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 if you look at our human species, uh, this whole men thing is a modern religion problem, by the way, so we, uh, you can go. 
the, the pre -mo the pre modern <laughs> religion women actually had more uh, higher higher status like in the society yeah. <laughs> Now you're it's, on the right it's, track. It's, it's, no, no, it's, it's been recorded actually because women could give birth, women could do certain things, men couldn't. In those societies, women had a higher status. The modern religion distorted everything, but anyways, let's go back. Um, how did our human species actually survive against other species? We figured out, uh, we overcome our uh, fear of fire. Mm -hmm. That was very important because as, as uh, animals, we, are, we have no skills. Even dog and every every other species can do something better than us. We are really good at nothing. Um, we have to so we had to be crafty. So we figured out the fire, but actually the huge impact of that was there was a protection mechanism. Mm -hmm. But that's actually the first example of connectivity and innovation. Mm -hmm. People would sit around the fire at night. They started talking to each other. Language developed. They pa passed on skills to each other. Generations, to do. so that's how humans actually became more and more intelligent over time through accumulated knowledge. Mm -hmm. And the first ancient internet was the fire, actually, the, the campfire, in in my view. Uh, just <laughs> one quick one uh, on the diversity and inclusion. This country is an example of reaping benefits of being being able to uh, incl uh, be inclusive in terms of getting immigrants to come and contribute and innovate. Mm -hmm. So. All this hoopla today, the fear politics you hear, they just don't, they don't need, even need to be technically smart. They just need to be able to read English and read our history, mm -hmm. even for the last 100 years. USA is a, a, a poster child for how diversity and inclusion can be, in, in, improve, increase the pace of innovation and help society mm -hmm. as a whole. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, when we talk about following your passion. Uh, this one's for you, Shifpreet. You have two things that are simultaneously uh, occupying your day, both your passion and, and expertise in classical Indian music ragas, as well as your high esteemed uh, position in the biotech field. These two things could not be more opposite from each other. Um, if you had to give a young professional some advice about following your passion, even in the face of failure, um, you know, you are someone who comes off as you're having your cake and eating it too. Um, you know, what advice can you give to young uh, professionals who may be faced with the fear that if I follow my passion, what if I fail? Yeah. I, I think it's to have multiple baskets and put all your eggs in all these baskets. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's great to have multiple passions and it's okay to, to have many of them and then maybe follow two or three of them. It's okay because you know what? Failure is always there and, and, and sorrow is, it can be medicine, duk right? Mm -hmm. it, it, can, it can solve such problems. Every time you hit a boundary, every time you, I hit a boundary and let's say I'm trying to make a composition from, uh, that is very tough and I, or I've spent three days on something and I'm, it's just not improving the way I think it will be. Mm -hmm. You know what I can do? I can shut it down and move over to cancer. Yeah. <laughs> and when I come back, you know, some, sometimes the answers are right there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's to, just taking your focus and, and putting it in, in, in different buckets mm -hmm. that are varied enough so you, your, your mind can have a vacation without actually going on a vacation. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a, um, the favorite husband of my, my wife because, uh, you know, I don't need vacations. This is a joke that we, we, uh, we go by every day. I'm not, I'm not the favorite husband. There's, there must be others. Wow. I want to give the audience a chance to also ask you uh, folks some questions, but I have a couple more before we wrap up. Um, uh, sorry guys, I'm stealing your time a little bit. I just, there's so much I want to uh, discuss with you guys still. Um, Navneet, specifically, when you're dealing with 
women who are victims of domestic violence within the South Asian community. You mentioned it before. Um, there's certain, you know, cultural ingrained uh, taboos in the South Asian community. You know, uh, one of them specifically is okay. Uh, you know, if if my partner is beating me, so what? He's my husband. He has a right to do that. Um, among other things, how do you overcome uh, these things that are very specific to our community in your work? So um, first of all, I want to clarify, we, we serve women, but we also serve men mm -hmm. um, because gender-based violence is not unique to women. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually term it like there are survivors of gender-based violence who can be women and men. Statistically, of course, um, a much higher number of women are victims, but we have had men call us too, um, and we serve uh, both genders. So in terms of barriers and how we address them, I think one of them I had already mentioned, the one piece that uh, Manavi is an organ, we are a 35 year old organization, and, and actually Manavi is the very first South Asian women's rights organization founded in the United States of America in 1985. So the reason I say that is just to give you context, that the six women who founded the organization in 1985 um, one of them is um, on our board still. I hear stories in terms of taboos. Back then, those women, were, when they went out to do the work that Manavi does, they were referred to and defined as home wreckers. Mm -hmm. And this is true. Um, they said that whenever they went out in, in, and talked about, you know, we're here to support, um, back then it was more, you know, mainly women. And they said that, that there was a huge stigma, taboo, because gender-based violence was seen um, mainly and primarily as a private matter. Um, and to be honest, even now, they, it, it, to some extent, uh, it is by some in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's something to be resolved within your own. And what will people think? Um, it is a huge barrier that we always worry about in our community, but I think that applies across the board, mm -hmm. you know, depending on what career you're choosing or what you're doing. It's it, this whole concern about what will the community think. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of addressing it, um, community outreach and education is something that, that we do a lot of uh, policy advocacy mm -hmm. um, is something that we engage with. And then Manavi is actually part of um, a national coalition of South Asian women's rights organizations and other women's rights organizations where we collectively um, advocate mm -hmm. and um, address these barriers. And as I said earlier, one of the biggest things is also engaging men. So now we have recently um, applied for and received a federal grant focused specifically on engaging men as allies um, so that we have men uh, and young boys um, involved in the movement. Language is a huge barrier mm -hmm. um, for, for many of our survivors. Where, um, to give you a very quick instance or example, we've had a survivor who I was personally advocating for and, and went with her to court and, and fought her case. Um, she was the victim, but when the police, and it was a Punjabi speaker, but when the police arrived at her door, because she was unable to successfully articulate her case, they took down the case from the husband and the police report that eventually landed in court framed her as the defendant, as a perpetrator, and the criminal charge meant she would be subject to deportation. So we've had this whole scenario where recently, because of the immigration <coughs> um, issues, um, a lot of the victims or survivors of gender-based violence are actually being framed as perpetrators themselves because of language barrier, because of their immigration status. Um, so I think um, collective voices and collaboration and policy advocacy um, and, and taking, I think the final note um, that I'll say is it's really important to take a multifaceted approach. Um, so what I mean by that is as an organization, um, we need to, to change how communities think and work. Mm -hmm. We need to look at short-term goals. So we have a short-term goal of supporting survivors every day in their immediate needs, but at the same time, we have a long-term goal of establishing communities which are, which are free from gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where we need the community members to be equally engaged um, in the movement. Wonderful, I think that's uh, very important work. Uh, Iniji, 
because of your particular background with uh, not just the organization, but Sikh history specifically, um, what lessons can you pull to share with young activists, specifically when we think of someone like a, a Greta Thunberg, right, 16-year-old, and she's made the world uh, think about what we're doing to the environment and the kind of worlds we leave behind. Um, what advice or lessons can Sikh history offer to these kind of young activists, whether they're Sikh or not, um, t today to keep them from getting discouraged in the face of adversity and opposition to their causes? You know, because this is the 550th, um, I want to say, share a uh, that we don't look at Guru Nanak Sab as, you know, we, we portray, or it's portrayed in the community as a very peaceful saint, a very peaceful man who traveled, who really didn't do much. But yet he was put in jail, right? He was the only um, so-called spiritual leader when there were the Mirs and the peers who spoke against Babur, mm -hmm. who stood for the human rights mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. And he was put in prison. Mm -hmm. so, we look at that and so when people say, you know, Sikh history, where did it, did it become only from the sixth guru or the tenth? And no, it began right there, right from the founder of the faith. So I look at that and then, you know, for the young activists I say, you know, if, every, if you're expecting a pat on the back every time and everyone is applauding you, you're doing something wrong. You're definitely doing something wrong. If you are not being yelled at by your parents, or you are not um, being, uh, you know, brought into school, uh, hauled into the principal's office for something which you are standing for, you're doing something wrong. Because that's what activists do. They change the systems. They go out and put out their necks where it is not comfortable, so now the part of getting discouraged, it's very easy to because it's such an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's day in and day out of just work. But then this lovely story comes to mind and it is, you're all familiar with it. They, especially within the community of these two young boys, six and nine, who are with their grandmother and they're going to be taken in to answer their call and they're asked to convert their faith and they're asked to do many other things and what does their grandmother tell them? She doesn't give them a long history lesson. She doesn't say anything. She just says one thing and she says, remember who you are. That's all that she said. That is all that Mata Gujri said to the two Sabsades. So therefore, when they went in, they knew what they had to do. It was within them. So for the young activists, really know where, why you are doing this, why is it so important, and what are you going to, what risk are you going to be prepared to take? Because the minute you challenge the status quo, the minute you start to ask, this is not fair or why, you will get the backlash. So be prepared for it. But don't fight with violence. This is not the sick way. This is really not the way. Fight with love. Fight with wisdom. Fight with patience. Those are your tools. So your ammunition should be that. Hone in those skills. When you do speak, speak with that voice of knowledge and also a voice which is controlled with patience. But be prepared to wait. It took us 240 years, the Guru period, before the Khalsa came, before, so change. And as doctor has very, told us over and over again today, human species are not the brightest tools in the shed. <laughs> we just need a little bit more time. But patience and be prepared. 
you know, you can be the armchair activist, the likes on your Facebook page and the Twitters and all that. You can do that, and that's very comfortable. Or then you can go out and march on the streets, or then you can pick up a cause, or you can just stand up for what Namneet said so well, that when you see some injustice being done, it doesn't have to be that big. It doesn't have to be glorified. It's those tiny steps that give you the, they, they are the learning blocks that enable you then to take the next one. Why do we always think that we need to fight that biggest case when we have done diddly squat, we haven't prepared ourselves? So go small, every day make it count. And don't forget, never forget who you are and where you draw that strength from. You've uh, given me a perfect segue into my next question. Uh, Dr. Sandhu, when we talk about conflict resolution or problem solving, right? Um, when we talk about scaling our approach, for you personally, you work in uh, such a high tech but dense field and you have for so many years. Um, what is your personal uh, preferred method when it comes to problem solving? Do you look at a, mi a problem and say, you know, this piece is broken, I need to fix it? Or do you have the, here's a problem the world at large faces, um, I need to find a solution for it? And is there ever a situation where they're one and the same? So the most important thing about solving the problems is not finding the answer, it's asking the right question. And, and that's where, when you're trying to work on a problem, you, so you have to look out, you can't just be focused on that, that piece of the problem. You have to look at a larger picture mm -hmm. and then ask a deeper question mm -hmm. and then try to find an answer which is more holistic than just that problem mm -hmm. or, or a solution to that problem. The other thing I've learned, even in the technical field, is that there is no such thing as sitting in a room, turning off the lights, and coming up with innovation. Mm -hmm. Innovation is best when it happens in a collaborative group setting mm -hmm. because you have multiple levels of inputs and opinions about what you're trying to solve. It's actually measured that it's even better served in a group which has a diverse opinion and diverse background or perspective they bring to that opinion. Mm -hmm. We are talking about diversity and inclusion now, it's a fashion thing in all the corporations. In, the, in, in, in our field, we learned a long time ago, not only do you have to have a diverse group of people with their diverse opinions in the room, they have to be heard. Mm -hmm. That's what inclusion means. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different. Some people need a little bit more patience to be heard. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, solving problems or innovation, and this innovation is not just for technical fields, right? So me, music is actually part of the same human trait. Mm -hmm. uh, arts, it all is an inner creativity expressed in different forms. So all those, uh, all those expressions of our, our creativity are best served in an in a, in a environment where it's inclusive and diverse. It's not just our happiness is better, more. It's actually the end net benefit of that innovation to the society is actually has a more lasting impact mm -hmm. in, in that setting. Um, talking about, now last question and then you guys, you'll have your go, I promise. Um, Shivpreet, talking specifically about your experience and knowledge of these classical ragas, um, this in-depth study that you've done on the arts and uh, the, the collections you've put together, including the one that you're doing especially for the 550th of Guru Nanak Ji Shabads. Um, how has that helped you excel in your career? Um, once again, in a completely polar opposite field, um, is there a connection? I think the connection is elegance. What you learn from the arts and by, by studying the arts, you, you see how elegantly to express and to solve problems. Mm -hmm. Let's say you, would, you were to make food and there was, you would make you know, different things every day, but you would use 
salt every day and no, no spices and did make the same thing with, with salt every day, it would not be elegant. It would not be tasty. It, would, it wouldn't be as enjoyable. Mm -hmm. What ragas do is they, they, they provide you some, some taste, some difference. I mean, every, if everything was white, you couldn't see anything. Mm -hmm. And what you're get, getting is elegance, but the, the second part of elegance is, is a way to communicate. If a picture is worth a thousand words, a raga, I say, is a worth a, hundred, a thousand videos. Because when you say uh, rag asa, you can see Guru Nanak hoping, right? You, you can hear Guru Arjan Dev Ji looking at the night sky and despite the darkness around, he sees the stars and he says, every saint is seeing the stars. This is the elegance. Why is E equals MC squared so, so beautiful? Because it's elegance, it's, it's simple and it translates super fast across. Mm -hmm. And similarly in cancer, you're, you're trying to look for very elegant solutions and elegance has to do with uh, beauty and also applicability across. So uh, one of these scientists in, in Southern California, in, in uh, South San Francisco, worked on, on a drug and people thought they were, they were joking. They said, we're gonna block uh, uh, blood from going towards these, uh, to, towards these cells. And by blocking this, we're gonna solve the cancer. The problem is, if you start, stop generating blood vessels, you're gonna kill all your cells. No one believed them. This was not, it was a crazy idea. But it was so elegant because it could be targeted towards these cells that were generating faster. The cells that are generating faster are developing more blood vessels. And this worked across cancers. The drug was Avastin and Genentech got it out and now it's used in lung cancer, colorectal cancer, different cancers, right? So elegant solutions can come about because of simplicity and applicability across. Wonderful. I think all of the uh, messaging from your end has been uh, elegant in, in terms of uh, probably your devotion to the ragas. Um, that does it for me. I, I think let's open up the, the Q&A now um, for folks. Um, so my question, um, Sifri, you, you spoke specifically about <laughs> an action you took around cancer for a friend. But everyone else has spoken of the motivation and the belief that leads to doing good. You've spoken a little bit as well, um, Navneet, about what others can do. You can, you can, you know, protest. You can, you know, write an op-ed. You can do things. I would love to hear, though, from the three of you one action you've taken in a personal situation where you've been moved to do well by doing good. In a, not in a professional setting, you mean? Like in a, or you mean just generally ourselves taking it? Yeah, so I can share one. Um, and Ravi is a testament to that, I think. So I, I used to practice as an attorney in England. When I came here, I took a break. Um, and you know, to be a mother and, and spend time with my kids. And then I was like, I need to get back. I, I have a passion for human rights and social justice. So this is going back many, many years. And with my husband, I would often talk about this, this that I want to get back into social justice and human rights because the, the law that I used to practice was human rights law and, and asylum law. So one day, and I think this is what I talk about when I say getting out of your comfort zone. It wasn't easy, but I applied to, because I was a, had a strong passion and believed in International Rescue Committee. It's an international NGO. It required me to go to Sudan. But it's something I had always wanted to do since I was 
maybe 17. Not necessarily Sudan, but I have always wanted to do some, you know, contribute in some way um, in, in a, you know, developed country or underdeveloped country. Now, this is when I was a mother. It certainly wasn't easy and maybe not the right thing by some people's definition. Um, I had a very supportive husband, very supportive in-laws. Um, again, you know, it, it makes a difference. And this is what I talk about when I say the definition of gender roles. And, and, um, and it's something I felt was my passion. Um, it took a lot for me to apply um, and take that step. Um, it meant a personal sacrifice. I mean, it wasn't a long time, but it was a time that, that you know, would have made. So I applied um, and I got the job. Um, I went to Sudan. I worked for International Rescue um, Committee for that time. Um, and, you know, it, I think it was something because I um, f had always felt passionately about and, and felt strongly about and wanted to make a small contribution um, and just took that leap of faith and um, did it. And to this day, I have to say, that work and doing it in, in, in Sudan and working with communities and children who were so underrepresented, it definitely impacted me as a mother when I returned, when I saw my own children living in luxury. You know, by most standards, I think everyone here would say we, we most of us have comfortable homes and our kids. So I think it put things in perspective for me that, that um, it is important, and again, I'm not saying everyone needs to go to Sudan. My point is that whatever your passion may be, whatever you may feel strongly about, um, whatever your calling may be, taking a step um, towards that um, is key. And I think that then shaped the rest of my career in that I knew I wanted to be part of an NGO and I knew I felt strongly about women's rights under the umbrella of human rights. Um, and I have since followed that passion um, and pursued it. You ask a tough question, Joyce, <laughs> because I am not a believer of, um, you know, and this is what I have been, I observed. I observed my grandfather. Um, I heard my grandfather is... Um, you know, people would come to him. In those days, there were no courts as such. And whatever his judgment was, whatever he said, they abided by, and that was wisdom. But he never once said that I did it. So I come from that school of thought that when you serve, you forget. You don't hold on to it because it's, you would just put there for that reason, um, you are just, you are a catalyst for that. But I think probably, um, you know, Navneet, you talked about something which you were very passionate about. Um, if there is anything that I've put myself out in, out of my comfort zone, it was, um, when I was, um, I think about 20 years, there was a camp, logger camp for two weeks. And I would go there for two weeks to volunteer. And there were a couple of young girls, young girls, eight, 10, 11, and they were dark skinned. I mean, you know, when you're out in the sun and the water, you get dark skinned. And um, one of the girls began to cry as we were going to leave. And I thought it was all because, you know, the the love which was in the camp. And she said, you know, I'm going to go home and everyone's going to call me. And she said, my father is going to say this to me, that um, you are dark, black. No one is going to marry you. And I was stunned, literally, um, firstly, that any father could say that, but it triggered a very a memory in, within me because I was, um, I was that dark child. I was the child that, um, that nobody wanted to hold my hand. I was the last one to, um, you know, in London Bridge is falling down, 
that game, Ring Around the Roses, you know, all that. I was the last child that uh, was ever picked on any side. And I could remember my, um, you know, we would go to friends' homes or, and the mothers would say, um, you know, if you don't drink your milk, you'll be as dark as any. I grew up hearing that. And, um, you know, you look in the mirror and you see that because when you're a child, that's what you see. It was when I was 52 that I told my mother, who was appalled, and she said, you didn't say anything. I said, because I believed it. And children believe that. But when I heard that little girl, there was something within me that reached out to her. And I was out of my comfort zone, and we had sessions then at camp about color and what it means to be dark within the community. And they would all look at me and they say, but you are so fair, you're white. I'm saying, but I grew up being told I was dark. So it's those type of things which I don't know whether I served, but I think I opened doors that people could speak about and maybe made a lot of other people a little kinder, not to be so harsh and talk so blatantly about some co the color because within the community, this color is such a huge issue. I mean, if I, as a child of two, three, and four, went through it, not by my parents, but by the world around me, and I, as a child, believed it, and honestly, um, I thank the love of my grandfather, my parents, and my mother, and my sister, for keeping me sane. Otherwise, I would have been completely um, a different person. If I believed what I heard, it, it's the love that protected me. So I feel very, very strongly, and um, I do talk about this. I mean, it's hard to talk about it because it takes you back to the memory, and people say, oh, what, you're on stage, you're so eloquent. And you're, that's not it, because I know right there in that corner is that girl who stood in a corner which nobody wanted to play with, who was an introvert, did not speak a word. So when my mother sees, used to see me there and she would say, I don't believe this is the same child. She never spoke. So that to me is service, but you don't talk about it. You talk about it in a way that hopefully it uplifts Hopefully it makes others think twice before calling another child black. And not to say there's anything wrong with black, but when it's used as a stigma to put you in a corner and make you feel small, or even to call you any other name, it's that power you want to be able to uh, ease or take away. I think for me that is it. I mean, there are other things, but it's not worth talking about. This is probably the one which is closest to my heart because I suffered. That's hard to match. Um, oh. <laughs> so I will. I'll, I didn't know. I didn't know. We are in competition. <laughs> there is a trophy. Okay. There's a trophy. <laughs> you know, but the men always get it. You know that, right? <laughs> We may change, uh, we may turn the tables. According to Navneet, yeah. we have a lawyer here. Yeah. <laughs> you got you. We have you. <laughs> we have the lawyer here. Yeah. So I'll mostly stay with the personal story, not the professional side of things. So growing up as an introvert child, I still remember situations where I thought something was happening, I should have done something. You know, that leader, in, I mean, you're a young kid and you're quiet. I never spoke in class. I was a backbencher. Um, so, but that lingered with you. I should have done something. I should have done something. Should have done something. The other point I want to add to that is, and this will lead to my story, in your life, everybody goes through a lot of experiences, positive experiences, negative experiences, traumatic experiences. I had them all. Now, what you do with those experiences is what shapes you. So 
two negative experiences I had. I was in New Delhi when 1984 riots happened. I was by myself as a young boy, student. When 9-11 happened, I was in Idaho. Somebody called, somebody called the police. Hey, I saw a guy with a turban. He's driving a white SUV with dark um, windows. So, and I actually met that person later. It's a long story. So you have those experiences, and then how does that shape you? What has shaped me out of that is that I actually, anytime I look at a sign of any kind of gener generosity out of, the, out of the, I guess, uncalled generosity or anything positive, I made it a mission. How can I amplify that? How can I, how can I feed it? Actually, Guru Nanak Dev used to say, there's a story, sorry for diversion. He'll go, he, they used to travel all the time and they would go to a certain village. People are really nice to them. And then there's the other places they'll go, people are not very nice to them. So people who are not very nice, they'll say, Basero means stay and prosper. And people who are very nice to them, he would say, Ujjado. Uh, I don't know, what did you? Spread. 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 It's almost uh, scatter. And Mardana ji, who used to travel with him, why are you, that's like a curse. You're giving them a curse. He said, no, no, these are good people. I want them to spread, spread this good around the world. So this is the story about that. So, so this incident happened in Barcelona. We were you know, just visiting uh, as a tourist. And, and, and we went to this place. It's a very famous church, Gaudi's church there. And we did our, sh there's a street side vendors. One thing I really found out is that there's a lot of immigrants like in any country, but Barcelona, Spain has 99% of immigrants are of Punjabi descent, right. Pakistan and India. They speak our same language. I, was just, I didn't know, it was a shock. And there's a lot of young kids who made it there because they get on a boat and they somehow make it there. And they're all illegal for three years, they have to survive somehow, then they get some rights. They can't even work before that. So. In this backdrop, so my wife wants to go shopping with the street side vendors, and she wants to have trinket shopping, and of course she has to bargain, right? <laughs> so, which you gotta do it. And then, you know, I was somewhere taking videos, and then, then we went to, back to the hotel, she shows me something, she says, see, I got this for two euros. And then she tells me a story, you know, she found this young 18-year-old kid, and they, they start speaking the same language, so her bargaining was even stronger, you know, I said, okay, I can, now, I, now I can handle this guy. We know we're on the same wavelength. He told me what happened. This 18-year-old killed kid, she, you know, I think this, he was asking for eight euros and she wanted to bargain. And he just put 10 euros in his hand, says, okay, pay me whatever you want to pay. And then my wife took five out or something, so they bargained. Now, if you know a little bit of Punjabis, this is Sikh, or it doesn't matter, it's Pakistan or here, it doesn't matter. There's, a, there's this trait of generosity, which is part of the culture. When I've traveled so many different places, if I go to a, play, go to a city where the taxi driver may be Punjabi or from that region. Now, this is usually it's a place where there's not that many Indians. They've seen people like me once in a while. It's in our culture. They will refuse to take money, at least sure. they'll offer it. Doesn't matter. Even once a guy from Afghanistan, I said, okay, why are you doing this? Oh, well, I know you guys do this, so I'm doing the same. So there's this sense of generosity which is inside of us. We offer it, no matter, even if we can't afford it. I just couldn't forget that incident all night. This 18-year-old kid, he's got nothing. He's illegal here. He's got three, he has to survive on the streets for three years. And he had that generosity. Give me whatever you want to give. And wife took money. Because <laughs> she was bargaining. I said, okay. So we had to go somewhere else the next day. We only went there for four days. I, we, I made her, we went back to the church, that space. We looked for him. Now these street vendors, they move around. Because the police, it's illegal to do that. So they come in, they have to run away. Took us half day, we just kept walking. She says, oh, we can't find him, he'll come again. No, she says, just remember how he looked like. In a few hours, finally, we found him some other place. He's got some other street. So then she says, yeah, I found him. Here's the guy. 
And he remembered her too because they had spoken in Punjabi. <laughs> so all I did was I had some, I put her, I will not say how much money, it's immaterial. And I, I actually went and shook his hands. And in my language said, you have shown the true spirit of being generous, being a Punjabi, yes. you know, that spirit. And then I just hugged him. And then he put his money in his pocket. So now, you know, uh, and then he says, okay, thank you very much and all. Okay, then he looks at him, um, uh, at my wife and says, okay, that's very generous of you. Well, take whatever you want to take from my... And she's looking at stuff like that. <laughs> you know, we're not going to do this. <laughs> we're not going to do this. But this, this, this is a story which touched me so much that you can, you can see this goodness in people. Goodness has nothing to do with what you own. Yes. Your sense of giving has nothing to do with your ability to give. It's your, it's, it's your uh, sense, it's your, it's your heart which matters. He had nothing and he still tried to take whatever you want to take. Yeah. So, so this is my only example of where I did something about it. It took me half my lifetime to go do something about it. <laughs> that spurred me to do other things in a professional setting, which I would not talk about, so. But he's the richest man who was able to say that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when we give what we say, so-called, that we give when we have so much, it is when you have nothing. Right. And you give, that is really true giving. Yeah. When you give everything what you have, have. Yep. That is the most generous person ever. Yes. I think Shivpreet will close with you because we're running out of time. Okay. We need one more question. Well, we, we, <laughs> do, we have, do we have maybe, time for one more question? I'll, let me give you three examples of, <laughs> of this because we're, we'll stay on the same page. Uh, I'll tell you a story about, uh, about what happened to me yesterday. I was uh, at, in Irvine in, in my hotel. I got down and I, I wanted uh, to have coffee. So I went to the, the Starbucks. And there, were, there was a long line at Starbucks, yeah. And it was, there was, there was this guy who was standing at the end, end of the line. He was smiling, beaming. And I stood right next to him and I said, hey, well, what are you so happy about? <laughs> and he was looking at his phone. He's like, you know what? A guy who was, I was, I was mentoring this guy and it, he got a job and I'm really excited for him. So that's example one. The guy was really happy right. about someone else getting a job, yep. right? So I, I kept talking to him. I told him, look, I, uh, we talked and talked. We couldn't stop talking until our turn to get coffee. And I told him, look, I, I was an introvert until I was in my 30s, <laughs> so here we go. Three introverts on the panel. Uh, and he's like, I, I don't believe this. You, you, you can't stop talking. What happened to you? Um, I said, I don't know. And by the time we, we reached the, the counter, he says, you know what? You're, uh, I'll cover your coffee. So that's the, exa that's the second example. I was, I was like, wow, thank you so much. <laughs> you made my day. I should be buying some stocks today. <laughs> So, so that's the, that, that's the, you know, I, as I have, it, it has been very hard for me to say thank you. And I generally, I would have said, no, 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 let me pay for this. But I, in my, in my, as my learning of thanking people for saying, oh, wow, your music is great. I've started thanking people now. Thank you. Instead of saying, no, no, it's not great. Um, so uh, I said, thank you for the coffee. I really, really appreciate it. And I thought my job was done. I, I was very happy. I went to my office and I told my admin, look, I got free coffee today. Let's buy some stocks. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, oh, did you buy coffee for the next guy? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I lost the opportunity to do the next good deed. Don't do that. That's the third example. Don't <laughs> do what I did. I should have paid for the next guy. Yep. Pay it forward. Well, I, I think um, we're all out of time here. I'm sure you guys want to ask these uh, wonderful panelists a lot of questions, but uh, 
We're all done here today. I want to say thank you to all of you for your time, but more importantly for your wonderful thoughts that uh, we can hopefully all benefit from and uh, bring about some much needed change in all of our lives. Thank you to the audience and of course the people responsible, uh, Mr. Tejiji and everyone else on the, the, the SAF team. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your help and uh, for bringing this program together. So thank you. Good evening and Satsrikal. Wow. What an am amazing session we just had. Truly stimulating, remarkable, and enjoyable. Thanks to all of you, Ashmita, Navneet, Ini, Gurtej, and Shipreet for enlightening us this evening. Truly, truly remarkable.